Welcome to the Business Model Sandbox, where leaders of all kinds come to explore and roll up their sleeves and test entire new business models, entire new and transformational ways to create, deliver, and capture value. We don't talk about incremental improvements to the way things are here at BIF. We imagine a different future, and then we work collectively to roll up our sleeves to bring that future to the ground in an emergent way to actually change the lives of citizens, patients, and students. I'm your host, Saul Kaplan, the founder and chief catalyst of BIF, and each month I have the pleasure of bringing someone from our community, a not someone who just thinks about it, but someone who is in the transformation space and brings a unique perspective and experience uh, to our conversation. This month, I'm really excited to have my friend Yolanda Wisher. Yolanda is a poet. Imagine that. We have a poet in the house, uh, in the business model sandbox. She's a poet. She's a singer. You know, she's a curator. She's an educator. You know, quite frankly, she's amazing. Uh, Yolanda, welcome to the business model sandbox. Thank you, Saul. It's awesome to be here. Uh, so excited for our conversation. Uh, uh, let me do this a little differently than I normally would. We'll come back and talk about you know, some of the aspects of the work you do, because it's really, really exciting. Uh, but I can't, uh, I just have to ask you uh, to, to introduce uh, yourself to our audience uh, and start uh, with a poem, if you would. Thank you. I'd love to. This is called Frida and the Black Girls. I took the girls to see Frida and she, we was magnificent. There was a no, no colored sign outside the pizza shop, but we pushed past the Gestapo and traipsed like Nefertiti's to the cold brick oven where Frida was sitting like a creamy lotus in the pan. And the girls stuck their fingers in the oven, even though they mamas had told them not to. And they brought Frida's cream to their lips blowing a gold dust into the absinthe eyes of the curating bartenders. And we taste Frida's Mayan underworlds in the basil and calamatas. And the girls discovered their own gelato while I bought a print with a few small nips of credit. Expensive stuff, Fela, or cheap art, mommy. We lifted the backs of our skirts, leaving the museum, our bottoms etched with vines. Oh. I, I really think probably most of the people listening to this would like for you to just spend the whole half hour uh, of our podcast uh, just uh, sharing poetry with us. Uh, I'm always inspired uh, uh, when I hear it. Uh, let's introduce yourself a little bit behind that. Have you always been a poet? Like, like you know, those of us who you know, would never wear a label of poet, although I know you're trying to change that, that you're, you believe we can all be poets and we'll come back and talk about that. But for yourself, like, uh, why is poetry so central? It's been central to my life since I was about eight years old. Um, you know, learning how to speak in rhymes or just kind of always having spoken in rhymes, um, always having been enthralled by imagery, the images of album covers that I grew up with. My mom was a child of the, the 60s and the 70s. So I had the benefit of great album cover art to stir up all kinds of imagination. Um, and I was just part of a great generation of great music. Um, and all of that just became the stew of my voice. Um, and I also come from some really amazing um, women folk who just were poets in their own right. Um, the way that they could bend language was powerful to me. Um, those were the, the really organic forces that made me a poet outside of, you know, having gone to school for it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is that. Um, but you just take to it so beautifully. And, and it's not just the written poet, but as a spoken word artist, um, I know you put as much into how people experience the poetry uh, and, how, and how they engage into it. Uh, I should mention, you know, that Yolanda uh, was the third ever uh, poet laureate of the city of Philadelphia. Um, uh, well deserved, uh, just amazing 
like I like to know a poet laureate like that that's a that's a crazy cool thing uh, but you're also uh, the, recently become the curator of spoken word at at a museum called Philadelphia Contemporary which is not your uh, your parents museum uh, tell me a little bit about what a curator of spoken word is and why would a museum need one and what's so special about uh, Philadelphia Contemporary? Well, you know, we're trying to build a museum in Philly, a new a museum of contemporary art, a new museum of contemporary art. Um, and it's a place where, you know, poets can kind of occupy the museum. I think that's the first thing that makes it unique. Um, and that was kind of what brought me on board with this idea. It was like, hey, you're going to give poets a seat at the table when you're about to build a museum. I'm all in. Um, and so, you know, thinking about poetry within the spectrum of art that is contemporary art, uh, where it, it certainly is part of it, but often doesn't get placed in that, in that realm, um, alongside visual art or, um, alongside other forms of like music, um, alongside others, you know, other forms of art that are deemed high art or worthy of being in the museum. Um, so my job as a curator of spoken word is kind of a, a pioneering path um, in a museum. Um, I'm not from that world, but I know about the power of poetry to bring people into spaces and make them feel comfortable expressing themselves um, and making those spaces feel, form spaces that may have felt um, uninhabitable or unwelcoming feel intimate and um, feel a part of a neighborhood. Tell me a little bit more about uh, the Philadelphia Contemporary. I first met you, I was introduced to you uh, by its founder, Harry Philbrick, um, you know, who brought this vision of reimagining a museum, right? Uh, there's, no t uh, there's no physical space yet. There will be, uh, but you're starting from how to engage the community, which plays to, you know, to, to why you're there, I think. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, without a building, you have to kind of start with the values. And a lot of that has been in our pop-up programming um, and how we do outreach around how we engage people in public art um, and how we welcome different audiences, people who already know about performance art or know about interdis interdisciplinary art and these new frontiers of what artists are doing with public space and just with space in general. Um, but people who are new to that um, and people who don't necessarily see themselves reflected in those, those spaces of art. Um, so it's also about creating space for local artists, international artists who have kind of a community mindset, um, who start from that framework first, rather than kind of think about it as an afterthought. Um, and Philadelphia Contemporary for me is also a lot about a partnership model of being a museum, not just building a building and then thinking about, oh, how can we have people get here? How can we use these partnerships with organizations to pull people in, um, which I think are the strategies that some folks use. Um, and I think we've approached it from like every event that we've done has been a partnership with someone else, another arts organization um, that we've learned a lot from in terms of this other art form. Maybe it's working with dancers, maybe it's working with poets, maybe it's working with DJs. We're learning a lot from how other arts organizations work as we put together these events and try to serve this and build a community around, you know, the space that we want. One of the things I love about uh, what, uh, what you and Harry and others are trying to do uh, in Philadelphia is exactly, as you said, this notion of if you don't start from the building, right, it forces you to see the experiences you deliver and their impact in a, in a whole different way. And uh, I mean, just take that conversation and move it over to imagining schools, uh, imagining what a hospital or the, that happens in the healthcare. Like, we're so oriented to this is the way it is today and that's usually around bricks and mortar and it doesn't free us up to do this and so how you're reimagining a museum uh, we can learn a lot from and thinking about reimagining whatever part of society uh, we're in so uh, I, it's part of why I'm so excited about this conversation let's talk about the notion of storytelling and poetry and spoken word as a vehicle for story Storytelling. You know, I made a joke earlier about, you know, I, so many of us, including me, you know, we don't identify, you know, as, as creative, you know, musicians, singers, you know, 
God forbid, poets, right? Um, and and you don't believe that 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 you you want to unlock that. So let's talk a little bit about the power of storytelling, whatever vehicle you choose. But let's use poetry, you know, and spoken word as the vehicle. What what are you trying to do with your poetry? Mm. You know, I'm trying to tell a story that I used to think was an ordinary story, um, a story that other people didn't want to hear, a story about growing up as a Black girl in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, that's my story. Um, and I'm also trying to tell a larger story of Black women and girls, you know, who were around me. And there, you know, the more I live my story, the more I learn about the historical forces, the social forces, the economic forces that govern their lives um, and that are still governing our lives that in some way make, make us less free, um, less free in ourselves, make us less free in our bodies, make us less free in our hair. Um, and I'm in some way thinking about poetry and storytelling as a liberatory practice, you know, that once you have the key to, uh, to tap into your story. Cause I don't think it's necessarily about unlocking. Um, some people have locked it away. Some people haven't discovered it. Some people have pushed it down. <laughs> some people haven't let it in, you know, whatever that, that barrier is, I think is the work that I'm trying to do first as the teacher, um, as the guide. And, you know, say, it's not always about poetry. It's about the utterance of speaking. It's also about the act of putting pen to paper. The, the impulse to want to write, I think, is essentially healing, is essentially the step to a lot of people's life-altering decisions. Um, and so I believe in that because it's a personal thing, but I also believe in it because of the work I've done um, you know, in prisons or working with women in reentry or working with young people in schools, um, you know, doing events around poetry, you know, when it's just a night out on the town for somebody and they become moved or their skin in some way changes because of a poem that they've heard. Um, that's why I'm in this, this, in this, this game of poetry, I guess. Yeah. It's so, uh, it's so exciting and it's so relevant to our innovation conversations, you know, here at Biff, you know, like people would say that, you know, what's the logic and connection to me, it's intuitive though. What we've learned here is that uh, storytelling and engagement is one of the we call it the three superpowers for transformation right you know human centered seeing it through the lens of the individual instead of your own lens the ability to imagine a different future and render it in a low fidelity way to see if it works and storytelling and engagement so for 14 years we've been trying to unbundle that and understand how we can lev use the lever of storytelling and welcome people to engage Engage with us in those stories as a path to transformation. So uh, you you just said it and you live it, you know, so beautifully. How let's uh, and I think it's true at the individual level as you're talking about, but it's true at the organizational level. You know, what's the emerging narrative and how does storytelling tell, help us figure out how we want to work together as a group, as a as a company, as an institution, you know, as people affiliated with a museum, whatever form or shape you know, that, that takes, to, let's, but we could also go to the community, right? I know you do a lot of community work because I've, you know, I've watched what you've been doing and, and including recently, you know, on Valentine's Day when I, like every other man on the planet, you know, was, was struggling with how do I, I do, I've been married almost 40 years, right? How do I actually put something down on paper that's meaningful um, after 40 years of, uh, of being married. And I tweeted something about it, making a joke about it. And you were right there, like back, like, like, call me. <laughs> I, can, I, I can help you with that. So you're trying to help other people become poets and storytellers to, to share their truths, to share, the, share their story, aren't you? Yeah, I'm trying to also be a vessel too if they're just, you know, not in the mood for it that day as many of those <laughs> those folks who showed up at my typewriter. I mean, I think it's kind of like a little bit like Kendrick Lamar is like be humble, you know? A lot of the work that I do is about our exercises and humility, I think. You know, it goes back to the things that like my great grandmother taught me, you know, as I spent a lot of time with her growing up. It's a certain way of just moving through the world, you know, where you 
you try to care about people as your your mode, you know, your general mode, you know, the default mode. Um, and sometimes I like to just be of service. I like to be available. And <laughs> that's the typewriter thing is kind of the height of that for me. And it's, it's also just a, lo- no, a lot of fun. No, you I love are. Typewriters. Like how would you, if you play out into the future as you, as you go forward in your role with the museum, like, do you, do you actually hold your, do, will you hold yourself accountable for uh, creating uh change in improving the community itself, like that individuals that you would work with in your programming that you would engage, you know, would end up becoming, you know, better and stronger themselves, but ultimately the community, you know, becomes a better and stronger place. Is that, uh, is that part of the goal? I hope so. You know, I hope there's a lot of forces that make that, make that hard to do. You know, this neighborhood is going through a lot of gentrification There are a lot of forces dividing the neighborhood more than maybe pulling it together. Uh, But there are also things that are surviving, you know, and thriving. You know, there's an amazing art scene in this neighborhood that I hope would still grow and thrive with Philadelphia Contemporary's help. And that they would see us as a partner and an ally in the work that they're doing and that they can become whatever they want to become alongside what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's all about the neighborhood for me in terms of curator of spoken word, you know, um, you know, that is something that I've kind of always just thought is something I needed to guard and look out for um, in any part of the work that I do when I'm working with big institutions, and especially now working within one. Um, it's sometimes just important to remember why, why am I doing this work? Who am I doing it for? You know, if it's not about the little black girls growing up in the black bottom neighborhood of West Philly, if they don't see themselves in that museum when it's finally built. Um, if my descendants who come to this brick and mortar building in the future don't see themselves in that building, then what was it all for? What was this work for? And sometimes it really is an act of imagination to, to decide, you know, how you want to walk through the world right now, how you want to show up in these roles, how you want to be a part of these institutions. Something I think about every day, you know? It's something I wake up with. Talk to me a little bit about uh, West Philly for, for those of us, uh, those in the audience who, who don't know what we're talking about here. Like, uh, how do you characterize West Philly? I, I, I could ask you to tell us a poem about it, but I won't, because uh, I know you've right. written, but I know you've yeah, written about it. Don't get me started. I mean, you want the poetic version? I mean, it's like the Philly love story place for me, but it's one of the Philly love story places. I think, you know, West Philly is a great Philadelphia neighborhood. Um, You know, there's lots of different parts of it. Some people know it for University of Penn and Drexel. There's a lot of big universities in that area. Um, And that's University City is kind of a distinct part of West Philadelphia. The Black Bottom um, is a neighborhood of Philadelphia that was predominantly black um, and was kind of raised over to build a lot of the universities that are there now. And there's still a lot of contentious, you know, elements about, you know, the relationship between the neighborhood and the university, you know, folks who kind of grew up in West Philadelphia and folks who kind of just come there to go to school. Um, There really are a lot of different West Philadelphias, um, but it's made up of a lot of different neighborhoods that have roots in community activism and the civil rights movement, um, you know, in in the vegan movement and all kinds of human rights. I think uh, it's just a really amazing neighborhood for the culture. Um, and the types of people who live there, you know, folks from all over the world, you know, all parts of the continent of Africa, uh, Asia, um, and of course, black folks from, you know, our, our, all parts of the United States. Um, so it's just, it's a microcosm of Philadelphia, you know, itself, but it's also just a happening neighborhood in Philly right now um, that is being charged up with a lot of young artists um, that are coming into the neighborhood, but also a lot of folks who are fearing that, you know, folks coming into the neighborhood are taking away some of the the local culture and local space, you know, local sense of um, ownership over that, that neighborhood. So let's transition to 
um, really excited about this part of our conversation because uh, you and I uh, have started a collaboration um, that is uh, really exciting. Uh, and I want to use it as an example of what we've been talking about. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about health and wellness in the context of West Philly and using storytelling as a way uh, to bring people's stories you know, to the forefront that, that, so that uh, we can begin to really understand the experience through the lens of people who actually live there rather than all these top-down theories of how we're going to transform healthcare uh, in an institutional way. Let's actually think about it organically and so uh, this is part of the personalized medicine by design project here at BIF and when you and I met uh, you told an amazing story at our uh, annual summit hint hint go to the BIF website you will not be disappointed go look at the 15 minutes uh, Yolanda uh, graced our stage uh, this past year amazing but so, since that you and I have talked I shared with you what I'm doing and what we're doing at BIF in the healthcare space and you said this is very aligned with what I'm trying to do in the neighborhood maybe we can do something together and we are so the first why were you so receptive to that? Like, what what about that idea resonated with you uh, in your uh, in your role? Wow, in my role, in my life, I mean, my just my personal experiences being a mom, you know, deciding to have a child and going through the healthcare system and ultimately deciding to have a home birth was like a big kind of jump into that arena for me and very enlightening in terms of, you know, how the healthcare system works and how I was perceived within it as a black woman having a baby. Um, and, you know, it also kind of opened the door for me into a Philadelphia community of folks who were involved with midwifery um, and a whole other way of taking care of self and health um, that I didn't even know about and knew existed and wasn't necessarily part of my family culture. Um, so, you know, then as curator of spoken word, I thought, you know, this is an experience that for me cuts across the job that I do or who I am. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have this experience, especially every year. I think you mentioned it. I was getting ready to fill out my, you know, application for healthcare, And I was like, the anxiety was mounting. And I knew other people were talking about it, too. And everybody has a story about this. Um, and so it started to started me thinking, wow, this would be a great way to approach our kind of unique brand of arts outreach in this neighborhood to think about not just saying, hey, here's some art, but how about we talk about something that's important, right? And there's some art, you know, and your stories are the art. Um, and, you know, let's make a bigger story together that then will maybe have some impact in some new way of thinking later on. Um, you know, I think this is about, you know, that kind of change that happens. It, it may feel like it's slow, but it's very powerful, powerfully built on the foundation of like a very human centered way of doing things. So, I, you know, obviously uh, I'm psyched uh, for, you know, to work with you on this. Let's talk about specifically what we're going to do. So uh, to bring that to ground in a way that we can both deliver, participate in, learn from, um, uh, what is the initiative? Talk about, we, we call it Story Cure, and it's, a, it's an event and a way we're gonna bring the community together. It's an experiment uh, for both of us, and uh, I can't wait. Talk about, uh, talk about what we're gonna do. Well, I, I worked with an organization called the, the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, which is a uh, fake uh, U.S. Department of Arts and Culture that was kind of acting in the service of doing that the work of what such an agency would do. And one of the events we would do every year was the People's State of the Union, which involves story circles. And so I found that in that work, the story circle was this powerful way of, you know, getting folks to tell a story around things that were important to them. Um, and so this is an evening of story circles where we gather folks to tell a story within a small group. Um, and also, you know, we bring the large group back, back to talk about the threads between those stories. But it really boils it down to, you know, asking folks to show up to tell a story about their experiences with healthcare or self-care. Um, and it's really not just a, a rant or a raving. It's really about one moment in their life where 
you know, they experienced the failure of the current system or they experienced some sense of relief or renewal or a way out or maybe a sense of community around um, health care or wellness. Um, so, you know, we're bringing folks together a, a space called the Community Education Center, which is an awesome historical space in West Philly for art and community gatherings. So I'm excited um, to tap into the community that CEC has, um, but also to invite other folks from West Philly and other folks from Philly who have stories that they feel need to be shared about this. Um, and then we're also going to have a poet, Trapita Mason, who is just an awesome poet and also a licensed clinical social worker. I don't know how she does it, but she's amazing. And her poems also speak to a lot of wellness and health issues in her work and in her personal life. Um, and I'm excited for her to set things off with some poetry, as I think poetry is always perfect to do. And, um, and we'll have some art making activities, ways for folks to use their hands, um, not just sit and listen, which I think is important. But I think, you know, we don't want folks to leave without doing a little something with their hands, making something for themselves that they can take away um, to keep thinking about health and wellness beyond the event. Yeah, it's um, it's just beautifully designed. Uh, you're in the process of curating the participants locally. We're going to be sharing it out uh, to our national uh, BIF community. Uh, and I can't wait. And it's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, the, the date is March 7th. I think we'll release this uh, before that. Uh, but uh, we have... Uh, of course, our whole conversation is about storytelling. So, of course, we're going to capture what happens there in in several different ways uh, that we can then come back to put together storytelling assets that we can share more broadly with those people who weren't there uh, with us that can engage and continue uh, the conversation. So, uh, stay tuned uh, for that. But I wanted this audience to hear the thought process of how we go from you know poetry and spoken word uh, to storytelling vehicles that engage uh, to community engagement that starts to shape, you know, how might uh, a, an important social system like healthcare uh, emerge uh, to do it? Uh, kind of any close off thoughts on the event, any your expectations, uh, you know, that relate to it? Uh, to, are you, I'm, just, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited. I hope we have a, a lot of different types of stories around healthcare and wellness. I'm hoping that the crowd is really diverse in terms of age, because um, I think people at different ages have very different experiences with healthcare. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to also make some new friends in this neighborhood, and uh, that, that I hope will, you know, support the work that I'm doing there going forward. Yeah, me too. Yolanda, I, I can't believe how fast uh, this half hour is gone. Uh, I'll come back and I'll do the perfunctory thank you for being here, but I can't resist yet again. Uh, can you uh, take us out uh, with uh, uh, reading uh, one of your poems? I, please, please. <laughs> of course. This is called No More Grandma Poems. They said, forget your grandmother. These American letters don't need no more grandma poems. But I said, the grandmothers are our first poetic forms. The first haiku was a grandma, and so too the first sonnet, the first blues, the first praise song is a poem. Therefore, every poem is a grandmother, a womb that has ended but is still expanding, a daughter that is radioactively aging and retroactively living. Every poem is your grandmother. You just miss her. You wouldn't mind seeing her again, even just for a moment in the realm of spirit, in the realm of possibilities, where poems are related to you and our relations and share blood and our kin and exist on chromosomal planes of particularity, where poems are your family and can't be easily shook off or forsaken or forgiven. I think words are not necessary. Uh, 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 I thank you for being here in the Business Model Sandbox. I'm so grateful uh, for our connection, and I can't wait to see you in a few weeks uh, uh, to hear some really incredible, genuine uh, stories of health and well-being. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you.